Music has always been deeply rooted in human culture and history. Dating back from antiquity and the Middle Ages, music has transcended and bloomed through time across different events in human history, reflecting all its struggles and ideals. In this year's Upsari Sari Musika Bahagi, we will take you on a journey through the historical eras of choral music and its stylistic subgenres, where we explore their different theoretical characteristics, rehearsal techniques, and performance practice that were shaped through the natural course of human history, cultures, thinking, and growth. Join us in learning about what makes choral music more than what is written in its scores and discover the beauty each musical period holds. Welcome to Musika Bahagi! Following the Middle Ages, the Renaissance was considered as the period of rebirth which marks the revival of the political, economic, scientific, and even more so, the artistic and cultural spheres of the society. To introduce us to the music of the Renaissance, here is composer, arranger, writer, performer, and also a faculty member of the UP College of Music, Professor Krina Kayabyev. Good day, everyone. My name is Krina Kayabyev, and today I will be sharing with you a few ideas about Renaissance music. First of all, thank you very much, UP Singing Ambassadors, for inviting me to be part of your concert. Before jumping into the aspects of the Renaissance period, let's look back to a very familiar situation that humanity faced a little more than 500 years ago, the Black Death. This bubonic and pneumonic plague combination caused the deaths of about one third of Europe's population and about 60% of the world's population. Strange black swellings about the size of an egg are found in the armpits or groin. Victims contract fever, spit blood, develop boils, and had internal bleeding. The first wave began between 1347 to 1400. Six more waves happened between 1400 and 1500. Difficult to imagine and feel how much worse this pandemic was back then. Also hard to resist the possibility that our current pandemic can go on and on for years now, and worse without proper governance and developments in medicine. Now, besides the pandemic, a lot of other social, economic, and political situations affected and influenced ideas about art and music. During the later years of the medieval period, there was the Hundred Years' War between the English and the French. By this time, science and secularism became more relied on over religious and supernatural explanations. This developing attitude of acknowledging one's senses rather than solely relying on the church as the ultimate authority in faith, intellectual, and political affairs serves as a precursor to the humanist values harbored later on in the Renaissance period. As what most of us, well, I hope, have been experiencing these last couple of months, we can say that music making never stopped. Developments in notation and compositional techniques continued on during that last 500 years. Let's have a glimpse on some of these pre-Renaissance musical aspects that were carried over and developed further in the next centuries, becoming the standard compositional techniques of the period. First is organum. The simplest way to producing harmony was adding a drone, either the same interval until the end or adding a fifth above. And then from the 9th to the 13th centuries, two or more singing voices were added. Of course, these combinations have to comply with the given rules of the period. It can be parallel, can be oblique, can be contrary. Moving towards the 14th and 15th centuries, we'd often find the term cantus firmus. It is usually an existing melody, like a plain chant, which becomes a basis of a new polyphonic work. This main melody was often found at the bottom of, say, a three-part vocal work, becoming another term for tenor. 
Now the two lines above create independent melodies while moving in interaction with the other vocal parts. In close reference to polyphony is counterpoint. And so with these, you have a cantus firmus, you have interrelated melodies forming a polyphonic structure, you have contrapuntal movements which aid in the horizontal direction of the piece, you have the recipe for a polyphonic renaissance work. Another driving essential element that became important in group vocal music is rhythm. The French, around 1320, were innovating what is called Ars Nova, or New Art. Included here is the writing system of mensural notation. In a nutshell, a piece of music is structured according to divisions of three or two. This was the precursor of the time signature. Then, you have fixed forms and trecento forms. Though first conceived as monophonic or solo songs, these forms such as AB or AAB or ABA were also employed in polyphonic songs. But by this time, the treble melody becomes more dominant, becoming the cantus in this context. Some of these fixed forms include the chanson, the rondo, the ballata, and the early form of madrigal. The development of vocal music continued to grow. Soon enough, Crucial occurrences marked the coming of a new way of thinking. This became the time when Florence became the city-state known as the cradle of the Renaissance. The Medicis became the most powerful and influential family. Two of the most prolific visual artists were Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. The printing press became a major means to the propagation of literature, ideas, as well as music. Patrons became important financiers of their arts, rather than a central church. Perspective became a key concept and practice that led to more realistic and naturalistic works of art. People of a particular region speak the vernacular, rather than the Latin language commonly used in the previous period. The Reformation movement led by Martin Luther challenged the practices of the Catholic Church. Now on to more of the musical styles that became transitional and descriptive phrases from the Renaissance. The interest to add more vocal sonorities in singing chants led to the idea of polyphony, or rather, Renaissance polyphony. Notation systems, song forms, and harmonic rules resorted to a new way of composing and transmitting music. From crude, harsh, open harmonies casual dissonance, parallel fifths, and octaves, the accepted music turned into having full, sweet, and controlled sound. While medieval composers tended to contrast the separate strands of music, Renaissance composers aimed to blend them together, working gradually through the piece and attending to all parts simultaneously. Counterpoint and harmony were utilized to create a sense of direction, tension, and resolution in Renaissance polyphonic music. And so, despite differences in usage and purpose, compositions for both sacred and secular music share similar compositional devices that are rooted in this Renaissance polyphonic color and texture. For the sacred genres, you have the Lutheran chorale, the English anthem, the metrical psalms of the Calvinist church, and the masses of the Catholic church. Polyphonic music had a new face through the music of Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina. His music has been described to have captured the essence of the Catholic response to the Reformation. Here is a passage from Pope Marcellus Mass. Listen and take note of the following descriptions. Consonant harmonies are heard mostly on every two beats to demonstrate sonority. Consecutive leaps, more than three, are avoided. Each voice has a great variety of rhythms, and text declamation is used, using melismas to significant syllables. Now with national secular songs and madrigals by the 16th century, they introduced the idea of music as a dramatic art. 
with the effect of music printing that allowed wider dissemination, music began to be sold as a commodity. With forms of group singing such as the madrigal, new ways of text declamation, imagery, expressivity, and dramatization were explored. A variety of homophonic and contrapuntal textures that overlap and the addition of voices from four, five to six or more toward the end of the century were all employed. This is an air composed by John Doland entitled Flow My Tears. Very much known to the Elizabethans, this is accompanied by the lute. Claude Lejeune composed this piece entitled Revecine Venir du Plantain. This features the type of French compositional technique called musique mesurée, where French composers wanted to imitate the rhythmic accentuation of their language. English had Thomas Morley and Thomas Wilkes, who extensively used the device, word thinking, in composing and coordinating the music with the meaning of the text. This is demonstrated in his famous madrigal, As Vesta Was. This composer, Claudin de Saint-Messi, wrote this track called Tante Kervignale, a kind of chanson which was part of the 50 collections published by Pierre Apanel. Another chanson is Clément Genecan's All Joli Jou. With such a light-hearted mood, its first line is translated to it is merry sport to play at tumbling. But before the Opsa performs this one, here first is Omanium Mysterium by Tomas Luis de Victoria from Spain. The Victoria would employ melodies of his motets to his masses, as what he did with this particular motet to Misa Omanium Mysterium. Ladies and gentlemen, the UP Singing Ambassadors.
century brought a variety of artistic and elaborately styled music from then pioneering composers such as Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, and Vivaldi. Believe it or not, their masterpieces were compared to a barocco, a Portuguese term which meant an oddly shaped pearl as it was heard back then as highly ornamented and exaggerated. Now, the Baroque period is recognized as one of the richest periods in history. To further understand the glories of this time period, let us now welcome the President of the Philippine Choral Directors Association and the resident conductor of the International Bamboo Organ Festival, Dr. Beverly Shangkwan Cheng, as she shares with us her expertise in Baroque music. In order to understand Baroque music, one has to realize the circumstances surrounding the world in which the music existed. You have to ask the question, in 17th century Europe, what was happening socially, politically, and in the area of religion? The two pieces tonight display some of the most important aspects of Baroque music. During this time, there was this war in vocal music as to whether text is more supreme to the music or if music was more important than the text. Italian composer Alessandro Scarlatti's Exultate Deo reveals an affinity to the older style, the music over text philosophy or the prima pratica in compositional writing. But what is fascinating about this piece is that not only is it an example of a work that represents the music that was very much part of the previous era, which is the Renaissance period, but it also represents all the music which was to come in the new Baroque era, serving as a link to its successors. Exultate Deo is a four-part a cappella motet based on Psalm 81. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Scarlatti said this in three distinctly exuberant sections. Exultate Deo, Alleluia, and Jubilate Deo. You will almost hear that there's this chasing effect of different motives which causes a dramatic, exciting drive, and it ends with a celebratory conclusion with a return of the Alleluia section. Thank you. 
earlier the need to know the circumstances surrounding the Baroque period, and we briefly discussed the issue of text versus music and music versus text. Now I'm going to introduce another issue that was happening during this time. You know, instrumental writing was rising in prominence very quickly during this period, and so there were questions about the significance of instrumental music. So contrary to the four-part a cappella exultate deo, which you heard earlier, you will now hear Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's well-known Oratorio Messiah, which is accompanied by a full orchestra. Next for Hallelujah Chorus comes from the book of Revelation in the New Testament of the Bible. Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, from Revelation 19, verse 6. Now from Revelation 19, verse 16, and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Finally, Revelation 11, verse 15, and he shall reign forever and ever. You know, many elements make this chorus stand out so powerfully. The first of which is the rhythmic setting of the word hallelujah. You know, Handel does not just set this with equal length, hallelujah. Instead, he elongates the first syllable at the beginning of the chorus, hallelujah, and punctuates with leluia. And of course, later on, as he repeats this same word, he sets it rhythmically in different ways, hallelujah, hallelujah, as the piece progresses. And... In one of the most important climaxes in this chorus, there's a point in which King of Kings and Lord of Lords is powerfully declared. And what is so amazing about this is that it is really set incredibly simply in a sense that it is only set to one note, one syllable per note. King of kings and lord of lords. Then Handel repeats this passage one step higher and higher and higher as if giving the impression to the listeners that at the end of the ascent of the lines, there's nowhere else to go because you've reached the top. And so this is one of the points of climax in this piece. But to me, my personal favorite is at the end, when the chorus reaches this grand pause before the final hallelujah. So you will hear, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. It ends there with that grand pause. Then everybody goes, hallelujah, as it ends majestically, exuberantly, and with so much declaration of praise.
In this day and age, the music of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart would instantly come to mind when referring to classical music as a genre. He and other prominent composers of this time period, such as Haydn and Salieri, has mastered the art of elegance in the music they created. And of course, it is worth mentioning the important transitional composers of this period, such as Gioacchino Rossini, best known for his operas, and Ludwig van Beethoven, whose works ushered in the Romantic era with a classical foundation. To share his expertise on the music of the classical period, here is conductor, composer, arranger, and book author, Dr. Joel Navarro. Hello, fellow fans of UP Singing Ambassadors Worldwide. This is Joel Navarro, and I will be giving you a tiny peek into historically informed performance practice of choral works during the classical period. Some historians say that the classical period roughly begins at about 1730, when composers like Georg Friedrich Handel wrote opera music that became increasingly dramatic and had frequent changes in mood in a particular scene. Parallel developments in Italian opera spilled over to oratorio, so it was increasingly hard to distinguish them, if not for the way they were staged. This period of transition lasted roughly 30 years until a time of consistency from 1775 to about 1820. Slowly, an international musical style was emerging. Enlightenment ideas such as liberty, tolerance, fraternity, separation of church and state spread throughout Europe. Traveling to different countries in Europe was much easier. More roads were traveled. There rose an international musical style. The new classical style had a universal appeal. It depended on a logical flow of ideas. Music followed speech to allow natural expression without artifice. Distinct styles came to the fore. The Galant style emerged, which became the foundation for the classical style. Classical music was lighter and more song-like. Phrases were generally shorter. Choirs sang more chordal passages, and harmonic changes were slower, unlike the quick-paced harmonies of Baroque music. Insofar as melody was concerned, there was frequent repetition. The melodic flow was interrupted by short, distinct phrases of two or four measures in length. A period consisting of two or more phrases formed a complete musical thought. Melodic phrase endings resolved readily as cadences. As far as harmony was concerned, there were frequent cadences that supported the periodic melodic structure. Harmonic movement was slower than in the Baroque era. The Alberti bass was used in repeated melodic patterns, which outlined the chord to animate harmonies without distracting from melody. Emotional contrasts during the Baroque period were typified as having strong and constant states of affection. These states dominated human emotions which were constantly changing. Classical music began to include contrasting moods within a musical section, rather than only a single emotion which typified Baroque music. In so far as musical dynamics were concerned, gradual crescendos and decrescendos gained popularity than the terrace dynamics of the Baroque period. Articulations in musical passages such as slurs were in greater use during the classical period to imitate the bel canto style of singing. When it came to rhythm and texture, there was a clear avoidance of the use of note inegale, a type of rhythm also known as overdotting. This practice of overdotting was very typical of French dance music during the Baroque. Choral texture was primarily homophonic in the classical period. There was less ornamentation in the classical period than in the Baroque. Ornamentations, including cadenzas, were given brief symbols. They were not written out in notes and often not marked at all. This is in striking contrast to the Baroque period when there were many symbols that were used one of the most commonly used ornaments in classical period was the trill, particularly cadential trills. They immediately preceded a cadence. These trills typically began on the upper note 
thus creating a greater harmonic suspension. It was common practice to conclude cadential points with a turn. Apoggioturas were another type of ornament commonly used. An apoggiatura is written as a grace note that appears before the principal note, and it would actually have received half the value of the principal note. It is approached by a leap and resolved by a step. Another example of ornamentation is the turn. The one on the left is how it looks like on the score. The one on the right is how it is played. Pitches during the classical period were approximately tuned to A430 Hertz, which is about a semitone lower than it is today at A440. There are tuning forks used by composers. The one that Beethoven used tuned A at 455 Hertz. Some tuning forks in France varied from 429 to 452 Hertz. The vibrato was considered a type of embellishment to the music. Woodwinds used both breath and their fingers to create vibrato. During the classical period, woodwind instruments were made with tone holes carved out of the instrument not keys which are used today. The design made finger vibrato possible. A few performance styles predominated during this transition period. Sturm und Drang, meaning storm and stress, was a movement in German literature that began in the second half of the 18th century. Its goal was to elicit shock in the powerful and even violent expressions of emotion. The Galant style. In 18th century music, Stile Galant referred to as homophonic style as opposed to strict, learned, or contrapuntal style. It is characterized by light texture, frequent cadences, heavy ornamented melody, and simple harmony. It is considered the characteristic style of the classical period and can be found in music from all the major centers in Italy, France, and Germany. Empfindsamerstil is a style associated with North Germany and could be considered a dialect of the Galat. The goal of the Empfindsamer style was to express emotion more naturally, sensitively and subjectively than in Sturm und Drang. Empfindsam means sensitive or sentimental, and it is characterized by simple homophonic texture, frequent use of appoggiatura or psi figures, and harmonic and melodic chromaticism. From a macro level, opera reforms were being made. Camera opera was gaining ground. New instruments were being made to favor a bigger orchestral sound. Because of these new and more versatile instruments, new and larger forms of music were being composed for specific instruments. Piano sonatas, violin concerti, and symphonies became more prevalent and celebrated. With all this background information, how then shall we proceed with performance? We are an oral culture. Do not be ashamed of it. 80% of the world's learners are oral learners. Musicians of the time knew what the style was by simply imbibing the musical idiom and studying with great masters. They lived and breathed the style, so to speak. For us living in the 21st century, it will be helpful for us to form the classical sound ideal in our head. To do this, listen to and watch classical performances online by well-known groups who specialize in this style. Subscribe to online classical music platforms. Compare and critique these performances as a choir. Vocal and choral preparation and performance are informed by the context of their time. The rise of instrumental music saw the development of more versatile instruments with wider ranges. Flexibility with key changes were easier to play and were more powerful in sound. The voice and the instrument always had parallel and interacting developments. So the advice is sing as if your voice was an instrument. Listen to how instrumental music affected articulation, dynamic phrasing, and expression. Vocal agility in operatic performances highlighted practices in phrasing articulation. 
and interaction with instrumental sound and color, sometimes in imitation, sometimes in complementarity. Here are helpful ideas to develop technical mastery for the classical period choral works. Breath. Develop alignment in breath. Give that tone good breath support. And the tone, make it flexible, warm, and expressive. Make it capable of gradual increases in volume and gradual decreases in volume as well. Give it some resonance, a good combination of high and low frequencies in the voice. Develop a mastery in, ex in executing a range of articulations and character, such as legato, marcato, sforzando, tenuto, and the like. Develop a mastery in ornament ornamentation in producing trills, turns, mordants, melismas, so-called rocket figures, singing rapid chord tones up and down. Study the score. What does the choral score reveal? What was the balance of performing forces then? Given our accessibility to only modern day instruments, how can we satisfy that balance? How do I get the sound of a organ positive? Is it in good taste to use sound patches in keyboards when all organ positives are available? <clears throat> Given our constraints during the time of the pandemic, let's make our decision out of the historical data to, that we have and make considered decisions to make the best out of what we have. Be insistent on the clarity of the cantus firmus or the main melody in choral writing. Keep the choral tone flexible and consider the use of regional Latin used during the composer's time. It adds a quaint color and character to the performance. Be sure to adopt syllabic stress to imitate inflections. Consider historically informed performance through concert venues. Is the venue of the first performance close in size to the current performance whole size? If not, were subsequent performances done in larger halls with larger performing forces? Consider how instrumental color and articulation of older instruments affect your choral performance. How are art articulations developed and executed during their time? The use of urtext scores such as Berenreiter uh, will be very helpful. If these scores are too expensive for you, buy a few copies. Use scores in the public domain and be sure to note down differences between the urtext score and the free score. Consider performance with lower concert pitch tuning at A, maybe at 430 hertz. Finally, do not obsess too much on historical informed practice. We cannot fully replicate it, but don't ignore it either. It's very good education. Your sincere attempt at HIP gives your choir and audience a partial glimpse of what it was like then. That is good enough. Your ultimate goal is to share the joy and beauty of the music. Thank you all for listening.
O Salutaris Ostia is a hymn of adoration and supplication which asks the Lord for strength and aid. This prayer is exquisitely set to music by Italian composer Gioacchino Rossini as his composition transmits the faithful's despair, hope, and complete trust in the Lord. This piece fittingly caps off this segment as it represents Rossini's growth in this time as a composer. Despite being famous for his classically built operas at the peak of his career, his work toward the end of it had crossed over to the Romantic period, which was when he found himself in Paris, finishing O Salutaris Ostia. We now take ourselves back to the late 18th century when self-expression was highly valued and was exuded in the music that was written. From the works of Brahms, Chopin, Tchaikovsky, and Wagner, we hear romantic melodies that prioritize emotion and the senses over reason and intellect. To give us an idea about the music of the Romantic period, here is a choir master of the world-renowned Philippine madrigal singers, Professor Mark Anthony Carpio. Nowadays, we use the word romantic to describe anything that elicits an expression of love. We use it to describe a person, a place, a situation, a movie, or a story. However, when we refer to that period of music history in the 19th century, 
the word is not used in the same sense. Originally, romance refers to a type of story that was written in a romance language. Romance languages are those that developed from Latin in the Roman provinces, French, Italian, Spanish to say a few. Because many of these stories were about love and adventure, the word romantic has been associated with them. And because the writers would set these stories in a scenic area, people have also associated the word romantic spot with beautiful places. But this was not the intent of the people who described the literary movement that began in the late 18th century. It was used to describe the imagination and inventiveness in telling a story. The word suggests not just love, but also adventure, scenic beauty, improbability, and make-believe. In his article, Romantic, the History of a Word, Thomas Ackerman wrote, Romantic in our current culture could be described as the opposite of logical. Romantic possessing a whimsical, creative, and imaginative approach taken by that of a dreamer, while logic being a more rational, calculating, and realistic worldview. Throughout the history of music, there has always been a tension between the classical and the romantic views of life and art. Objectivity versus subjectivity form versus freedom, universality versus individuality. Classical music requires control of harmonic tension, balance between dissonance and consonance, and careful and complete exploitation of thematic development. On the other hand, the romantic spirit requires releasing of formal constraints and a carefree expression of the ideas and emotions of the individual composer. Movements like Romanticism frequently come as a reaction to something else. In this case, it was partly a reaction to the Industrial Revolution that began in the latter part of the 18th century. Followers of the Romantic movement rebelled against mechanization, mass production, and urbanization. These were seen as contrary to their vision of an idealized and natural state of being. People were turned into work machines that lacked the capacity to make informed and uncoerced decisions. Another significant event that happened around the same time was the French Revolution. Its events and ideologies can be seen as factors that led to the breakdown of aristocracy and the development of 19th century liberalism. Robert Garretson in his book, Conducting Choral Music, writes, In the world of the arts, it was paralleled by the rise of the Romantic movement, in essence, a revolt against formality and authority. Romantic composers tended to write out exactly what they wanted with regard to dynamics, tempo, and expression. Before this period, composers would write very little of these markings in their compositions, or none at all. Any edition of music written before 1750 that contains dynamic, tempo, and expressive markings not clearly identified as editorial should be considered questionable. Quite opposite, the 19th century composers became generous in marking their scores. Nevertheless, one should still closely examine the text in order to properly apply the markings indicated by the composers. In their desire to exercise their individuality and freedom from rules, composers in this period often sought to break the strictness of rhythm without having to disobey the time-honored rules. Even without changing the time signatures, composers would employ meter changes, resulting in displaced accents. 
Different ways of syncopation were also used as an expressive device. Rhythmic patterns became intricate and irregular phrase structures were used. Tempos ranged from extremely slow to extremely fast, and they were closely aligned with the mood of the music. Expression of varying moods within a composition resulted in abrupt changes in tempo. The wind-up metronome was invented in 1815. Composers started to write metronome markings on their scores. Nevertheless, they were meant to be guides. Even composers themselves did not follow their own metronome markings at times. Accelerando and ritardando were frequently used. Rubato was practiced to the fullest extent. Manipulating the tempo was considered expressive. Generally, in performing music of the Romantic period, the tempo should be somewhat elastic and it should reflect the expressive nuances of the text. Similar to tempo markings, extreme dynamic markings were also used, ranging from 4 Ps to 4 Fs. In contrast to the relatively smaller-sized ensembles in the Classical era, composers in the Romantic period employed combined forces of large orchestras and choirs. This became the ideal medium for expression of these extreme dynamic levels. Gradual swelling and diminishing of tone became a widely used expressive device that created an illusion of distance oftentimes employed with nuances in tempo. More Italian terms were used to describe the precise intent of the composers. In addition, composers started to use their own language for expressive and dynamic markings. Knowing their precise meaning will definitely help in the interpretation and performance of the work. Composers explored the limits of the major-minor harmonic system. Harmonic chromaticism gave them a wider range of expressive devices. As a result, dissonances were more frequently used. The Romantic era was a period in which individual expression was very important in the interpretation of music. Romantic composers used standard notation and indicated in relatively specific terms the way they wished for their music to be performed. So, in performing the choral music of the period, I recommend that one studies closely the text and the markings of the composer in the score. Only then will you have a solid foundation for an effective performance. For the best performances of these works, full and mature voices are recommended, voices that are capable of producing a wide range of pitch, dynamics, and expression. Some authors argue that musical romanticism is predominantly a German phenomenon. In the book Choral Repertoire by Dennis Schrock, the chapter on Austrian and German Romantic composers has the longest list of names. This includes Beethoven, Mendelssohn, Schumann, Bruckner, Brahms, Mahler, Wagner, Strauss. Some of the composers who are not as famous but are still considered significant choral composers include Peter Cornelius, Josef Reinberger, Max Reger, Fanny Hensel, Max Bruch, and several others. In addition to being famous as composers, some of them were great pianists, organists, and conductors. However, most of them were divided in their views of music. On one hand, there were those who looked at the past and wanted to maintain or restore older styles and forms. These historically-minded composers studied Johann Sebastian Bach and were influenced by his music, Mendelssohn, Brahms, Reger, among others. 
On the other hand, there were those who believed that music should move forward and that they should tread new paths and create new forms of music. These composers, in particular Schumann and Wagner, advocated what they called the New German School, which led to the beginning of a modern, seemingly structure-free type of writing music. Mendelssohn was a child prodigy. He played his first piano recital at age 9, began studying composition at age 10, composed his first piano piece at 11, composed his first overture at 17. When he was 20, he conducted a revival of Bach's St. Matthew Passion to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the work's composition. Mendelssohn was proud of his practice of looking back to the past. He wrote, No one can prohibit me from delighting in and continuing to develop what the great masters have bequeathed me because not everyone should be expected to start from the beginning again. Composition is to me a continuation to the best of my abilities, not a dead repetition of what already exists. Mendelssohn composed two oratorios, eight secular cantatas, 26 sacred cantatas and other large sacred works, 40 small sacred pieces, and 60 secular part songs. And these are just his choral works. What you will hear from Upsa is his setting of Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. Then er hat seinen Engeln befallen. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. He wrote this in 1844, dedicating it to Friedrich Wilhelm IV of Prussia, who had survived an assassination attempt shortly before. He would later include this motet in his oratorio, Elijah. One way in which the Romantic spirit was expressed in the 19th century was through nationalism. Whereas classical music tended to be universal in character, romantic composer and compositions paid tribute to their country of origin through the use of folk melodies, dances, or instruments, or through musical depiction of some place in their homeland. This became popular especially among Polish, Hungarian, Russian, Czech, and Scandinavian musicians. One of these composers who used music to express nationalism was Edvard Grieg. As a strong supporter of the nationalist movement in Norway, he worked towards giving the Norwegian people an identity through music. With this, he became the first Norwegian composer to achieve international recognition. Upsa will be singing his song Voren, originally written for voice and piano with words by the Norwegian poet and journalist Asmund Olafsson Vinje. The song speaks of the Norwegian landscape's seemingly magical emergence from winter to spring. Images of the thawing ice, flowers, the newly green grass, the birds and butterflies can be seen as you listen to the music. The poet wonders if this might be his last spring, observing that life has brought so much more than expected and that someday all must come to its end.
The 20th century was clearly a period of widespread experimentation. Music changed dramatically due to the hostile political climate, advances in technology, and huge shifts in style. Unlike the previous periods, one cannot describe 20th century music in just one general way because of its diversity in the range of musical forms and performance practice. Composers started to escape from traditions of the era, creating a broad range of totally new and often radical music. The traditional classical music branched off into lots of different sub-movements such as Impressionism, Futurism, Modernism, Minimalism, the rise of atonality, jazz, and the use of electronics and technology. As a result, there is no recognizable distinct sound to the music of this period. At the turn of the century, French musicians search for greater independence from German music, seeking an idiosyncratic path of their own. This launched the first in a series of modern artistic movements that revolutionized society's attitude towards art as well as leading to the introduction of movements such as Impressionism. To tell us more about this musical style, here is one of today's most sought-after composers, Mr. Eileen Matthew Maniano. What comes into your mind when you hear this music? surreal, dreamy, does it make you feel something? Well, at the start of the 20th century, there were several styles developing and Impressionism was one of those. The whole idea of Impressionist music was that musicians were drawn to convey moods or emotions rather than distinct sounds in a song. Uh, they wanted their pieces to evoke feelings. It all began with this painting. Claude Monet's impression, Sunrise, where the term was borrowed from. It gave the Impressionist movement its name when the critic Louis Leroy accused it of being a sketch or impression of an unfinished painting. Thing is, Impressionist artists were less fixated in painting a reflection of real life. Instead, they give us an impression of how a landscape, thing, or person appear to them at a certain moment in time and show it to us as if it were happening before our eyes. So, what made Impressionist music unique? Music became less clearly confined by traditional harmony and form. It lacked defined and steady rhythm as form is very fluid and changeable. Impressionists explored new harmonic directions through unusual chord combinations, the use of major seven chords and the chord extensions. They also explored Old tone and the pentatonic scales as well as the different modes and keys uh, thus creating a tonal ambiguity and the blurring of the tonal center and cadences which leaves the listener the feeling of uh, an anchor in any key like floating in a keyless space. The French composers Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel were the two leading figures of Impressionist music. However, Debussy never liked the term Impressionism, and he quoted this. He actually preferred the term Symbolism when referring to his music, which is a literary movement that directly inspired him. Debussy, being an intrepid explorer, continued to push the boundaries of music and explore new sounds. He developed a remarkable harmonic language and new structures that can be related to Impressionist and Symbolist aesthetics. His major source of inspiration for his compositions was about the mysterious nature. Clair de Lune or Moonlight is the third and most famous movement from Debussy's Sweet Bergamasque. Its title comes from a poem with the same name by a French poet, Paul Verlaine. Clair de Lune, probably Debussy's best loved and best known work, is a timeless piece with a self-reflecting nature that evokes different emotions and treasured by its ethereal beauty and sense of mystery. Due to its popularity, it has been arranged not just for a wide variety of instrumental combinations, including notable orchestrations, but also for voice. 
During the 60s, there's a group that pioneered and became very influential in the transcription of orchestral, piano, and instrumental music into vocal music, the Swingle Singers. This group specialized in a cappella classical music, madrigals, and eventually on to different styles. It was in 2013 when I first heard Ward Swingle's arrangement of Claire de Lune, sung by the Swingle Singers, live. It simply elevated the beauty of Debussy's music into a different level. Hearing them made me realize that vocal music can be transcended. So fast forward to last year, 2020, I made my own setting of this piece, which you will hear shortly. Impressionism's focus on emotions and feelings somehow offered an escape from the restricting rules and regulations of the previous era. It paved the way for the further development of music and offered composers an alternative venue to express themselves better. I'd like to leave you with these words from Debussy. We should be constantly reminding ourselves that the beauty of a work of art is something that will always remain mysterious. That is to say, one can never find out exactly how it is done. At all costs, let us preserve this element of magic peculiar to music. By its very nature, music is more likely to contain something of the magical than any other art.
friends, we just have watched, listened to, and heard music and lectures of the country's top and respected names in the field of choral music. This covered half a millennium of European music history and culture prior to our present time period. My dear colleagues and choristers, I am happy to realize that your presence tonight is an indication that you are all aware of the importance to educate ourselves to the history of music to have a better understanding of the pieces that we perform. This lecture concert aims to introduce some important concepts in music history to those who are seeking to be exposed in classical music and maybe a review to those who have a little more experience. This definitely guides us to make informed and correct decisions including our cognitive perception and subjective artistry when it comes to interpreting period music in a contemporary setting. Through the years, through scholarly scrutiny, we have observed lots of changes in terms of form and style. But even with the ever-changing music scene, one cannot deny the importance of learning from those who came before us. This is how we come up with innovations. We work with the ideas that the great masters of the past have left us. And then we question, we challenge, and improve what we have grasped in order to come up with pieces and performances that speak of and reflect our current times. To all the musicians watching, especially our young budding conductors, we are challenging you to acquire this information and do more reading and listening. Truly, this will further elevate your musicality. Let us all continue to explore and hone our skills and make this time period, our time, as interesting as possible to our future generations. This virtual concert will be concluded by a piece composed in these contemporary times by one of the leading composers of our country. In 2019, I wrote an elegy as a tribute and farewell to a dear friend and brother, Kuya Pains Berto, who unfortunately passed away during the UP Singer Ambassadors 2018 European Competition Tour. UPSA commissioned Maestro Ryan Kayabia, our national artist for music, to set the poem into choral music. In a way, it has become part of the group's grooving process. The composition encapsulates profound emotions through its soundscapes, reflecting the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Even today, the song resonates more as we experience different forms of grief in this pandemic. Loss of human touch, loss of our freedom, our dreams, our loved ones who have succumbed to this virus. Let this song guide and inspire us to move forward to acceptance, to a new life, to hope. Kapit, 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 kapit
Thank you very much to our distinguished guest speakers, Dr. Joel Navarro, Professor Mark Anthony Carpio, Dr. Beverly Shang Kuan Cheng, Sir Ali Mati Maniano, and of course, Professor Krina Kayabiao. Thank you and God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.